I'm not sure that there is a muscle that gets more unfairly blamed more often than the psoas muscle or the iliopsoas muscle group. If you look up psoas releases on the internet or YouTube, you're gonna find a lot of different methods. You're gonna find stretches, you're going to find manual release techniques, you're going to find myofascial release techniques, you're gonna find a lot of different things, but the psoas is not necessarily the problem and just going after that muscle in isolation is probably not really gonna fix anything long-term. Let's break down some anatomy first. So we understand that the iliopsoas muscle group is not one muscle, it's actually two, made up of the iliacus and also the psoas. The psoas is primarily the conversation for today. I'll briefly address the iliacus later on, but the psoas attaches on the lumbar spine and it runs all the way down into this inner portion of the femur right here. Because of its attachments on the spine and the femur itself, it has three main actions that it can do. The proximal or closer to the center of the body fibers are going to be more responsible for creating spine rotation to the other side. So that means that if this pulls right here, then I'm going to get a spine rotation to that other side. That would be the right side if my left psoas was contracting proximally. Distally at the femur, you're going to see more external rotation. So if these fibers down here contract, then I'm going to get a turning out of the femur like so. Together, these muscle fibers can contract to create flexion of the hip or bring the thigh closer to the hip. No one muscle creates anterior pelvic tilt or restrictions in mobility. It's all just responding to the position of what the skeleton is allowing that muscle to do. So people systemically go into anterior pelvic tilt. It's not just one thing. So when I go forward on both sides, usually what happens is that the pelvis tips forward and then goes into external rotation on both sides probably more so on the left if we're thinking about that left AIC pattern, which I'll address in a second. So if I'm forward, externally rotated, then that allows my psoas as a whole to pick up leverage to shorten because it's already placed in a shortened state. And that also means that my external rotation bias of my pelvis and the femur itself are going to turn out. So that means that that psoas muscle is shortened, so it's probably gonna feel pretty tight. So if you release the psoas with one of those weird ball contraptions, is that really going to educate your body on how to control the tilt of your pelvis? Is that really going to educate your obliques how to control the relationship between your rib cage and your pelvis? Of course not. So was it really your psoas that created this whole problem right here of this forward pelvis and then the back extension tone? Or maybe your back extensors pushed you forward. Or maybe you really had elongated or weak abs which allowed your pelvis to come forward. Maybe you had weak hamstrings which allowed your pelvis to come forward. Maybe you sat all day. So you can see how it's all kind of, is it the chicken or the egg? We don't really know. But what we do know is that this is a systemic thing that takes place. So the psoas needs to be opposed by muscle that do the inverse function. So because they create external rotation and hip flexion, and that leads to this over time, we would want to facilitate muscles that promote internal rotation and a posterior rotation of the pelvis with the rib cage coming down in the front. Here's an example exercise that'll do much more for you than simply just stretching your psoas and hoping for the best. But we also want to start with these feet slightly outside of our knees. This is that passive internal rotation aspect of this activity here. Now, the degree of which you are in this passive internal rotation should not be overly significant, so we're not way out here. We should just be maybe 10 to 15 degrees of internal rotation. So about here is what we're gonna be looking for. Now, what we're gonna do here is place our hands on our low ribs, maintain contact of the foot, and this is really important, of the heel and also this base of the big toe where the ball of the foot is here and not losing this lateral toe right here, but focusing on this part right here and the inner heel and we're going to keep our foot on the wall. And on both sides, we're gonna think about dragging down on the wall with that inner aspect of the foot where the foot arch would be. And that'll naturally tuck our hips off of the ground slightly. So the tailbone comes slightly off of the floor and we should feel our inner hamstring muscles as we do that. And now what we're going to do is just maintain this position, exhale through our mouth, big open mouth sigh. 
for about five to 10 seconds, keeping our stomach relaxed. And the only reason why we feel any tension whatsoever is because we are getting recruitment of our side abs through that long extended and soft exhale. That's why it's five to 10 seconds long. And then we're gonna maintain a slight amount of tension in those side abs as we inhale through our nose, keeping our mouth closed. And that's going to expand our chest and our back. And that's exactly what we're looking for there. All the while maintaining those foot pressures and feeling those inner hamstrings on both sides. If you're having a hard time feeling your hamstrings, you can set up a shelf for yourself like this, but it's really important to make sure that you are A, still in a 90-90 position, and B, keeping your whole foot on the wall, because we're trying to still feel those foot pressures on the wall. If your feet are off of a wall and you're just digging into a chair or a sofa or something like that, then you're not going to be able to create that reference of the arch of the foot working with the inner hamstrings, working with the pelvic position that we're looking for. So it's very important that we are maintaining foot pressure on a wall here. Let's get into some asymmetrical patterns right now. And I'm going to be referencing that left AIC pattern that I talk about commonly. I have a full video and article on that if you're curious to learn more. When I talk about this left AIC pattern, what I'm referring to is this pattern where the right side is hiked up, the right rib cage is down because we are more weight bearing on the right side. We're more in right stance. So the lumbar spine is actually rotated more towards the right. So the left psoas tends to be a little bit tighter because we have a lumbar spine that's oriented to the right. The left psoas helps facilitate that, as well as a femur that compensates into external rotation on the left. So we have the distal attachment also likely to be a little bit tight. Now, because this left side is forward, we also have more hip flexion on the left side as a whole. So you can see how this left psoas would have more likelihood to become tight and stay tight over time because there's a missing degree of internal rotation and posterior rotation of that pelvis. Now you might be wondering, well, what if I feel psoas tightness on the right side? Well, that's usually because you're forward on both sides. And so that right psoas also picks up leverage to create that external rotation and also that flexion of the hip. But again, it's going to be relative to the left. You can still have a lot of external rotation forward pelvis on the right. It's just the left one's gonna be a little bit more. So if you only feel right psoas tightness, chances are you are forward on the right side as well as the left, but your right psoas is probably working to create a little bit of stabilization to hold you in your right side so you don't fall too far out of your right side. For years, people referred to the iliac psoas as one muscle group, as I mentioned earlier. However, the iliacus is its own separate entity. The iliacus has distal and also proximal fibers within it. The distal fibers create more external rotation because they attach, again, on that inner aspect of the femur. The proximal fibers, however, have more leverage to create internal rotation of this pelvic bone right here. So the iliacus can actually be a beneficial muscle to use when going after internal rotation. The good news is, is that the role of the iliacus, especially on the left, as it relates to creating that internal rotation proximally, is already taken into account when you look at the traditional PRI drills, or when you have a lot of these exercises that are promoting internal rotation of both the pelvis and the femur on the left. So you don't really have to worry about it all that much. You want a foam roller, and that usually works best for this activity. And you want to set up where you can get your knee and in line with your hip as much as you can, but it's not going to be maximal hip extension for a lot of people. Some people have to bring their knee slightly in, and that's okay. You just wanna be in as much hip extension as you can get in without losing your hip tuck. So the first step is to get this back, and for a lot of people, it's further back than they really initially realize. I'd encourage you to film yourself doing this. And then give me a nice slight tuck of the hips there, Keith. And now he's going to feel those ribs come down and he's going to dig down with this left knee and drag it back to engage his inner thigh. Now his left inner thigh is engaged. He's digging down on that foam roller with the knee, pulling it back inwards towards his body. Now he's going to take that left arm and reach it towards his left knee. But again, we're making sure we're not losing our posterior pelvic tilt here. Now, He's in a good position, got his inner groin on, got his left abs on as he exhales. He's going to turn these toes down and lift this up as much as he can without feeling a cramp in the side of his hip. And then he's gonna inhale and lower it back down. Exhale, come up, 
Good, actively reaching towards his knee, inhaling, coming down, making sure we're still trying to pull the foam roller inwards towards our body. So in this in position, he should feel the side of his butt cheek. And I'm gonna move your hand really quick there, Keith. He's gonna feel the side of his butt cheek right here. You wanna roll that hip over a little bit more. Right here, he's gonna feel the side. If you feel down your leg right here, then that's a sign that you're probably lifting up too high or your leg is too far back and you're not in real hip extension, you're probably arching your back at this point. If that's the case, you can just move that knee up further on the foam roller. But just make sure that you're in as much hip extension as you can get without losing this tuck and you're feeling the side of your butt cheek rather than the side of your leg. You can tell the difference between those two things because there's a bone, bony protrusion kind of poking out from the side of your hip. If it's around that region and below it, that means you're kicking out a compensatory muscle. If it's behind that, then you know you're probably getting the right muscle. That's your gluteus medius. However, on the right side, we actually want to inhibit or reduce the tone in the proximal iliacus. And we want to facilitate the distal iliacus to create external rotation of the right leg because the right leg tends to be a little bit more adducted and internally rotated. So we want that iliacus to help facilitate but not be the primary contribution of external rotation on the right side. Here's an exercise for inhibiting the right proximal iliacus and facilitating the distal iliacus. So we need to be in this 90-90 position to start, and we're gonna have a 90 degree bend at both our knees and our hips. And the first thing we need to do is just perform a posterior pelvic tilt, get both hamstrings on. So Trevor, I'll put your hands on your ribs right there. Then I'll have you just gently exhale and then pull down on the wall with your heels and you're gonna feel your tailbone come off the ground, low back stays flat, both hamstrings should engage. But the whole foot is flat, the focus is in the heels. Now what we wanna do is a left hip shift. So I'm gonna have you pull your left knee down and your right knee up, so your knees are kinda of doing that. And you're gonna feel your left inner thigh engage and more left inner hamstring, still keeping that pelvic tilt. Now the last step is to take the right foot off of the wall and externally rotate it this is going to turn on that right iliacus, those distal fibers that we're going for. We need to keep the right knee higher than the left. That's going to be what most people lose. And now at this point, we're gonna be feeling left inner hamstring, left inner thigh, a little bit of right outside hip. We just need to make sure that we're holding that the whole time, breathing in through our nose, out through our mouth, focusing on the whole foot is flat, but that heel on the left especially is what we're sensing. The most common mistakes in this involve the right leg usually. So as he takes the right leg off of the wall here, what people are gonna to wanna to do is if they don't have the external rotation, they're going to side bend to the left in order to do that. Or what they're gonna do is they're just gonna dump that leg way far off to the side. And while the knee is going to go outside the midline of the body a little bit, stay within your active external rotation range. So if this is all you got, or if you have even less than that, just work within what you're capable of and don't push it too much. As long as you're feeling the muscles we're going for, sensing that left heel, all is good. As always, I'm going to go off of my objective test to determine if I'm having success. I'm not just gonna have someone walk in this gym, have them do an exercise and say, all right, see you next week, I hope that helps. I'm going to end up looking at their assessment results. So if I have a forward pelvis on both sides, I will see an improvement on hip flexion and straight leg raise if I'm being effective in bringing back that pelvis on both sides. On the left side in particular for internal rotation, I'm going to be going off of the Obers test primarily. That's a really good indication. And also internal rotation of the femur. On the right side, I'm going to be looking at external rotation of the hip and also hip flexion. That's a really good indication as well. 